So, as, as most of you already know, I've had like a cold the past week and like a bit of a cough and everything like that, but I'm praying that I won't be coughing all over you uh, and that you'll still be able to hear, uh, still hear the word today. Um, guys, we're almost done, Daniel. There's only like, like after today, I think we'll only have like one or two more messages in the book of Daniel, and then that'll be it, and then we, then we have Christmas. <laughs> we could start over, but... Um, so last, well, not, not last week, and not the week before, really, and it's been like three weeks since we've actually been in Daniel proper. Um, the last time we were looking at the first, most of chapter 11, where God gives Daniel these ridiculous prophecies that just cover like hundreds of years of history. And a lot of that was fulfilled. Uh, But the last part of Daniel 11 hasn't quite been fulfilled. Uh, Antiochus, who we were looking at last time, he partly fulfills some of these things, but a lot of the things in the passage itself have not fully come to pass. So I wanted to take some time just going through these verses uh, to, to fill in the rest of the chapter so that we can move on properly to chapter 12, which has a lot of really good stuff. Um, now, this the, the actual subject matter of this passage is heavy. Uh, it's, not, it's not one of the nice, just come in here and you feel nice and everyone's nice Sundays. Um, it, it's a bit heavier, and then the actual application for us might even be heavier than that. But I think that's good for us. I think it's good that um, God has things in his word that challenge us, because if he never said anything that challenged us, we'd have to wonder if we were actually hearing from him. Um, we serve we serve a God who's holy, and the love that he has exists within the context of that holiness and his justice. So we want to approach the word from that perspective. Um, also, be warned, I've got like literally three pages of scripture things that I'm going to be reading. Um, so we'll be jumping around a lot, but I'll try to keep things organized. Um, so I'm going to pray and then we'll read the passage and then we'll jump right into it. Father God, we thank you that you are holy, you are glorious, you are mighty. You are, you are the creator. You are the, the God who made us. You made this world and all that is in it. And you're fully deserving of all glory. We pray that as we hear your word today, we would give you glory because of it. We pray that your word would inspire praise in us. We pray that your word would strike us in places where we need to be, um, where we need to be cut and shaped. We pray that um, your word would comfort us in the places where we need to be comforted. We pray that we would um, have ears to hear what you're going to say. And I pray that I would in no way be a distraction from what you want to say. So we give this time to you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So Daniel 11 verses 36 to 45. Um, All the things that I'll be reading today are from the ESV, but I don't know if anything's going to pop up on the screen that's different from that, but I think you guys can handle it. So verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these. A god whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. At the time of the end, 
The king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasuries of gold and silver, and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. The king shall do as he wills. Who, who is this king? Who is this king who's exalting himself and worshiping himself as God? Well, we, we see in verse 31 earlier in the passage um, that this is referring to a strong ruler who takes away the daily sacrifices from the people of Israel and sets up the abomination that causes desolation. And in verse 40, we see that the time that this happens is the time of the end. So this is a king who's around at the time of the end. Elsewhere in Daniel, we see this same character appearing. In Daniel 7, this is the little horn speaking boastfully, arising from the final beast or empire in Daniel's vision. This is the one who makes war on the saints until the Ancient of Days comes. In Daniel 8, this is again a little horn who takes away the regular burnt offering and throws truth to the ground, destroying the saints and rising up against the prince of princes. And in Daniel 9, this is the prince who confirms a covenant with many for seven years, then three and a half years into it, puts an end to sacrifices and offering, setting up the abomination that causes desolation. So this, this figure that keeps popping up throughout the book of Daniel uh, this is who we're dealing with here. Uh, this is um, one of the longer descriptions of who he is and what he's like. Uh, and this is the last we'll actually see of this in the book of Daniel. Um, Antiochus Epiphanes, who is spoken of earlier in chapter 11 um, and in other parts of the book, he serves as the model for this king. Antiochus... Um, is, is like a model of this, this king who is still yet to come at the time of the end. So when we, when we looked at him and we saw, oh, he tried to glorify himself as God, he persecuted the people of God, he had all these wars against other people trying to conquer, um, but ultimately, like Antiochus, his rule was really limited, he died, um, and, and some of the things that happened in this passage he didn't fulfill. Um, but he pointed to the one who would. Um, elsewhere, elsewhere in the Bible, this is the figure that might pop up. You, you'd call um, the Antichrist or the man of lawlessness. And we'll be looking at some of those passages today. Um, so that's who this king is. And it says that this king shall do as he wills. And then he gives, for the next few verses, just like a list of all the things that he does. And I, I want to split those up into three focuses. So, like, there's, there's the things that he does that help us to see who he is as a man. There's the, thing, the things that he does that help us to see the source of his power. And then the last little bit, um, it, it goes into his interactions with the people around him, the people of the world. So, verse 36 and 37, we'll look at this man. Uh, first thing, he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Uh, this is someone who's going to stand up and take the place of, I mean, like our god. He's going to try to take the place of the god of every religion. He's going to say, those gods are not worthy of worship. I am. Worship me. I am the great one. I am the one who created you. I, um, I'm the one worthy of all glory and power and everything. Um, he he doesn't he doesn't pay attention to the other gods. He doesn't he doesn't care about 
you know, being, say, like, politically correct, it's like, oh, respect other religions and this and that. Like, he doesn't, he doesn't care about that. Um, he wants everyone to worship him. Uh, he speaks astonishing things against the God of God. So not only against the false gods, but against even the true God who reigns in heaven, he speaks out all these horrible, horrible lies. He speaks out all these boastful words. Um, this, it's, it's the fullness of the rebellion of man. This is someone who completely epitomizes sin in, in a person. Um, the, the rebellion that Adam started in the garden when when they took the fruit and they said, we, we want to be like God, uh, this is where it ends. This, this man fulfills and, it, it, and completes that sin that was started way back there. This is, if you, if you think about it, it's the capstone on all the attempts throughout history to take the place of God. Um, we can look at the fall in, in Genesis where the serpent says, you, shall, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That was the temptation. You will be like God. And they're like, yes, we want to be like God. This is where you have the Tower of Babel, where men were like, oh, let's, let's build this tower. Let's reach it up to heaven. Let's, let's build a name for ourselves so that we won't be scattered throughout the earth. We, we, want, we want to accumulate power and wealth and success so we're going to build this tower up to heaven and take the place of God. This is Pharaoh saying to the Israelites, I don't know, like who, saying, to, saying to Moses, like, who is who's the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I don't, I don't acknowledge this God. He's not God. I'm God. I'm Pharaoh. Look at me. This is in, earlier in Daniel, like Belshazzar, the Babylonian king who lifted him, himself up against the Lord of heaven. He took the things from the, the temple of the Israelites, and he, he had like a party with it. He's like, oh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're just going to spite this God who seems to be against us. This is Antiochus Epiphanes, who we were talking about earlier. He called himself God Manifest. Like he, he claimed to be God. This is all of the Roman emperors who claim deity. This is the North Korean leaders today who present themselves to be gods in front of their people. And this desire to take the place of God is something that we, as human beings, learned from Satan. Because that was his sin. He didn't, he didn't want to serve God. He wanted to be God. I'm going to read Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. Um, in, now, in Isaiah, this was written against the king of Babylon, but later Christians have also applied it to Satan himself because there's a lot of parallels there. So starting in verse 12, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn! How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low! You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. That, that sin, that, that desire to, to worship ourselves and take the place of God, um, that's, that's what this man is doing. And um, it's not like he's, it's not even like he's being like more evil than humans normally are. It's not like he's invented some new kind of evil that no one has done before. He's just being the most honest about it. This man sets himself up to be God, to, to replace Jesus. And that's why we call him the Antichrist. He's the false Christ. He's the false Messiah, the false anointed one. So he's speaking these things against the God of gods. He's worshiping himself. He's trying to get all this glory for himself. And what do we, what do we think happens next? Is it, and then God smites him immediately for his blasphemy? Well, no. Um, it says that he'll prosper till the indignation is accomplished. Why, 
okay, so he's prospering him. He's, he's doing all these things. He's speaking against the God of gods. He's worshiping himself. And God is like, okay, I'll let that go on for a while. Yeah, well, okay, go for it. Take some time, do that. Prosper, have success, have wealth, have power. Sure, conquer the nations of the world. Like that, what is going on here? Now, we, we do see that it's only for a time. It's till the, the time of wrath or the indignation is accomplished. So he, he's only in power for a limited period of time. Uh, but during that time, I think what's going on is God's wrath against the sin of the rest of the world is revealed in allowing the world to have their king. Like the Israelites, when they said, we don't, we don't want God to be our king, we want a king like ourselves. We want a king to rule over us. We want a man to rule over us. That's what's going on with the world. We don't want God to rule over us. We want a man. And God's like, okay, I'll give you that. I'll give you the king you deserve, not the king that you need. I don't want to go into a Batman reference. That would not be proper. But it, it, it truly, this, this man truly is the king that the world deserves because of our sin. Like we, we deserve a ruler who blasphemes against God and claims to be God and demands our worship and oppresses everyone. Um, that's, I mean, that's who we are choosing when we reject Christ as our king. So, so this, this prosperity and the success of this king is part of God's wrath against the world's sin. Um, it says in verse 37, he is paying no attention to the gods of his fathers. Um, no, no interest in them. Any, any religious background that he has, he's jettisoning it. Jettisoning it. That was a hard word. Um, it also says that he pays no attention to uh, the one beloved by women. Um, I don't totally know what that means. I don't know if that's referring to a specific God of that time or whatever, but um, regardless of what God it is, he doesn't pay attention to them. He has no interest in them. He worships himself. Um, and in Second Th Thessalonians 2, verses 1 to 4, Paul talks about this. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So Paul's saying here that uh, we know that Jesus hasn't come back yet. We know that you know, he, he hasn't come in his second coming because this man of lawlessness hasn't come first. Um, this, this man of lawlessness, this false king, he is supposed to come first, he will worship himself above every other God, proclaiming himself to be God, and then Christ will come back. The source of his power, if we look into the next verses, so he, he, he has all this power, he has all this glory he's accumulating for himself, he's speaking things against God and heaven and all the other gods, but where does he get this power? Where does this come from? Uh, it says that instead of honoring any other God, he... He honors a God of fortresses instead. So there's power. He worships power. You know, he's, he's worshiping himself, no other gods, but he will worship power. And he'll worship the one God in existence who will give that power to him. So 2 Thessalonians again, uh, chapter 2, 9 and 10. Who is this God? The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. So when it says that he worships this God of fortresses, he worships this power, that power is coming from 
the enemy. It's coming from Satan. Satan is the one empowering this man to, to rule and declare himself to be God. He worships uh, Satan, but probably even more specifically, he's worshiping the power that he can get from Satan. I don't think he particularly loves anyone but himself. Uh, but this, when it talks about the God that his fathers did not know, that's who this is speaking of. This isn't some uh, regular run-of-the-mill demon god that the, the nations have worshipped. This is Satan himself, uh, and this will be a very this will be a very new thing. Nothing like this will have ever been seen in the world until this time. It says that in verse thirty-eight, he shall he shall honor this god with with gold and silver and precious stones and and costly gifts. He he will take his wealth and he will honor this God. And in doing so, that makes that God attractive to the world. The world will see, oh, this this man who is rich and powerful and successful, oh, he's giving giving his wealth towards this God. Oh, we should should worship that God too. We We should follow after that. The world will be drawn away by the wealth and the power and the glory. Um, It'll it'll cause people to worship falsely. Moving down through, um, the way that he interacts with the world. Um, So his, with his enemies, um, so in verse 39, he shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. So this is, this is the, the nations he's going after. This is everybody else. He's dealing with his enemies with the help of this god of power. He has military victories against them, and he'll conquer entire nations. Um, the, in, in Revelation, it talks about the, the dragon giving the beast this authority, um, and that's, it's the same sort of thing. I'm going to read Revelation 13, 1 to 10. And I saw a beast, that's this man, rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on his horns and blasphemous names on his heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard, its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon, that is Satan, gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed. And the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. So just as an aside, that, that appearing to have a mortal, fatal wound, but he seems to be okay. It's like a false resurrection, uh, mimicking Christ. So the whole, the whole earth is led astray by this false, false miracle. In verse 4, uh, continuing, and they worshiped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to, ta- to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, with a sword he, will, he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. So this, this beast is empowered by this dragon to make war against the world, make war against the saints, the people of God, and he's successful. That's how he's dealing with his enemies. Uh, and we think, like, how, why, why does he have all this power? Where is this coming from? Um, and again, another similarity to Christ he was tempted with the same temptation that Jesus rejected in the wilderness. Luke 4, 5 to 7. And the devil took him up, as Jesus, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. 
if you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And, and of course, we know that Jesus rejected that. He, he said, like, no, worship only the Lord. This man says, I'll, I'll, that great deal. Yeah, I'll worship you. Give me, give me the nations of the world. I want that. So he makes war against them, and he, he conquers, and he has victory. Now, those, that's how he deals with his enemies. With, with his allies, it says that he loads them with honor, those who acknowledge him, those who do serve him and worship him. He'll, he'll give them presents, he'll give them gifts, he'll load them with wealth and honor. He splits up land and makes people rulers over many. Like, if, if you want power, you, you go to this guy. You, you, if, you want, if you want the same sort of thing that he has, you, you run after him, and he will, he will lift you up. He will make you wealthy. He will make you powerful. This man, though, he's, he's a false messiah. He's a false savior. He's got a false gospel. He's like, I'll, I'll give you peace and safety for anyone who worships me. Anyone who doesn't worship me, you get wrath and death. But we, we would say, like, what? But we're supposed to worship God. We're not supposed to worship man. If we worship this guy, he'll give us peace and safety and wealth and power and comfort, but we face the wrath of God. If we worship God, we get eternal life and we're with him forever, but then in the moment we're faced with the wrath and the the anger of this man. So he's setting himself up against Christ, and it's it's a very binary choice. Uh, But then you're thinking, well... What's, what's the problem? He's not in power today. There's no, there's no guy running around the world, conquering nations, claiming to be God. And, you know, that's, that's true. We know that from what we read earlier, he's still waiting to be revealed. Um, but does that mean that we can take all this and say, okay, thanks, Scott. I'll put that in the back of my mind. Uh, I'll, I'll think about that. And if it happens to happen within my lifetime, okay, I'll, I'll pay attention. Um, I don't think that we can take any of God's word like that. He's not in power today, but I'm going to read some verses that, uh, from, from John's letters that maybe give us a bit of a different perspective. So starting in 1 John 2, uh, 18 to 22. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so the singular So now many antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is the Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. In 1 John 4, 2-3, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. And then 2 John, verse 7, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. So what we see here is that, yes, there's this singular figure who is coming, but then many such figures have already come. And they're in the world today. That, that spirit of the Antichrist is here already. So that means that anything that's applying to this man who's in Daniel exists in some form or another in the world today, and so we need to be on guard against that. So who in, in these passages, who are these Antichrists? How, how are we to, to know what that is or what that looks like? Uh, Really, really simply, it's those who deny that Jesus is the Christ. It's those who reject the lordship of Christ. Uh, John talks about people who went out from them. So it's like there were people in their communities 
uh, who initially appeared to be believers, but then they, they went out from the communities and they're, they're preaching all these false doctrines and false things against Christ. And he says, like, well, because look at the way that they left to, to do this sort of thing. They couldn't stay among us because it just didn't fit. Uh, but that's to show that they, yeah, they, they are false and, um, and that they, they are serving the spirit of the Antichrist. Um, and so the, the final antichrist, the final beast, the final lawless man, uh, he's simply the complete manifestation of this rebellion that exists today and has existed. Uh, and this already exists in our culture. We should know that. This is the air that we're breathing today. The, when, when you go out into the world, when you go out into the universities, when you go out into the workplace, when you're listening to the, the, the TV or the news or anything, these messages are already there. And I'm not trying to say it in some like conspiracy theorist way, like, oh, if you listen to the recording of CBC backwards, it's got these evil things. Like, no, it's just um, the, the cultural assumptions that we have, uh, the, the different ways of viewing the world and viewing humanity, um, those, those are already in place today. They're just not fully manifest the way that we might see in the future. Instead of worshiping Christ, we, in the world, we try to worship ourselves, and we just call it humanism. But that's, that's what that is. That's, oh, we, we want to exalt humanity. We love people, but that we don't want a God over us. We want to serve ourselves be yourself, be true to yourself, follow your heart. All this stuff about self-esteem and self-confidence and selfies and self, 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 self. What is that? That self-glorification, that self-worship, that's the seed of what's going to fully grow out and be revealed in this man. John three sixteen. now we all love it. I'm going to read from 16 to 20, because um, this talks about the way that the world receives Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. So that's, that's what the world is like. Jesus comes to the world. He's this great light. But we're all like, no, we don't, we don't want that. We don't want that light. We don't want that king. We're, we're fine. We're, we're okay. We're, we'll be okay on our own. Let, we just want to stay in the dark here. And what that does to our world and our culture is it leads to all these deceptions. We make all these false assumptions, and we work out our philosophies and our ideas from there. So Paul warns us in Colossians 2.8, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So that's a real threat. There are real ideologies, there are real worldviews out there that are opposed to Christ. And we have to be very careful that the worldviews that we're adopting are actually according to Christ and not opposed to him. Because if we adopt this worldview without even knowing it, that denies him. The whole way that we live, the whole way that we see the world and interact with people is going to be changed and not for the better. And, and of course, to, to accept the world is to, to, to deny Christ himself. Uh, 1 John 2, 15, 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, 
is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So this spirit of the Antichrist is the same as the spirit of the world. Is that, is that just general rebellion against who God is. It's the rebellion against the revelation of Christ as Lord. Um, it, it's intermingled with all of the sin and all of the fallenness of humanity. So then, if, if this whole spirit of the Antichrist and all of this, it's signified by this, um, signified primarily by a denial of Christ's lordship, then that means that our confession of that lordship is incredibly important. So think for yourself, do you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Yeah, I, I think most of us would say, yes, Jesus is Lord. Awesome. Do you confess with your life that Jesus is Lord? Does the way that you live align with the confession of your mouth? Does, does your heart actually believe that, that confession of your mouth? Because when we sin, we deny that confession. When, when, we, when we sin against God, we're rebelling against the Lordship of Christ. We're saying, I don't want to do it your way. I want to do it my way. I don't want you to be my Lord. I want to be my own Lord. I think, like, when, when you sin, who are you worshiping? It's an act of worship. Anything that we do, we're either worshiping the Lord with what we're doing or we're worshiping something else. When, when we sin, who is your functional Lord? Because we might say, Jesus is my Lord, but I'm kind of doing this and I really like to do this. And like, we have to take that seriously. Like, and then, and even still, like, do we really confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord? Are we actually confessing that? If someone were to ask us on the street who that Jesus is, if someone in our family or our friends were to ask us who that Jesus is, what is our response to them? When we're interacting with the people around us, do we acknowledge Jesus as our Lord or do we stay silent? And the silence isn't neutral. The silence is a rejection, a denial. And if we're not confessing Christ as our Lord, who are we confessing as our Lord? In, 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 in all of this, we need to be remembering what he's done, remembering what he's still yet to do. I mean, remember, remember the fact that he saved you with his gospel. He, he died and called you and made you alive so that he could be your Lord and that you could be his and you could uh, serve him and love him and walk in obedience to him. And, and we need to remember constantly that even when we sin, even when we rebel, even if we verbally deny Christ, there's still mercy for us. Like, remember Peter? Like, super, super disciple man, was like, willing to go with Jesus to death the night that he's going to be killed, and then they arrest him, and he freaks out, and he leaves, and he runs off. He's in that courtyard, and there's this little servant girl, really threatening. She's like, oh, I thought you were with Jesus. He's like, no! No, not at all! He's not my Lord. I don't worship him. Peter did that three times, and, and then Jesus died, and he was freaking out. But then Jesus forgave him. Like Jesus, Jesus restored him. Jesus had mercy on him. So when we, when we sin, when we deny him, when we fail to, to serve him uh, as fully as we should, there's grace, and we would do well to remember that, or we'll just be despairing every time we do anything wrong. So like that's, like there, there's those two things. There's the weight of like, we, we need to actually live it out if he's our Lord. We, and we are the, we're either serving the true Christ or the false Christ. There, there's, it's one or the other. It's a very binary thing. Because who else would? Like if we're not worshiping Jesus, who are we worshiping? So we need to take that really, really, really seriously, but not 
condemn ourselves needlessly because Christ took away all of our condemnation. And, and we obey him and we love him in light of the love that he's shown to us. Not in just plainly out of fear of, like, um, fear of punishment or anything like that. Okay, we're going to move back to, move back to Daniel now. Um, so the, there's the gospel for us today in terms of how we're interacting with the spirit of the Antichrist that exists in our world today. And, and then this passage also talks about how, um, how even on the Antichrist that is to come, there are still limits. There are still um, restraints put on him. He will not reign forever. He only prospers for a time until the wrath, the indignation is accomplished. What is decreed shall be done. So let's walk through, um, I'm going to walk through Daniel 40 to 45. And I'm just going to sort of, we'll jump in and out and work through that. So at the time of the end, so in the future, the king of the south shall attack him, uh, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. Um, king of the south, earlier in the chapter, that's identified primarily with Egypt. Uh, king of the north, that is this, um, this figure. So I don't know totally how that's going to work going into the future, but that's generally how we can think of it based on the past. Um, rushes at him like a whirlwind, the chariots and horsemen with many ships, and he, the king of the north, uh, shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. <coughs> he shall come into the glorious land. So uh, this, this man in his war against the south, he's coming into many countries, he's overflowing, he's completely wiping them away, he's passing through, and he'll sh- he shall come into the glorious land, and that's Israel which makes sense because you go through Israel to get to Egypt. Uh, Tens of thousands shall fall. So like this will be horrifically violent, horrifically uh, tragic. But these shall be delivered out of his hand. Not every nation will fall. Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. Uh, Today that's around the, the nation of Jordan. Again, I don't totally know how this is going to work out, but at least what we're seeing is that there are limits in terms of even who we can conquer. God is saving some of these other nations from him. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasuries of gold and of silver, Mm -hmm. and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. So he's successful. He goes against the king of the south, and he conquers, conquers Egypt, he conquers Libya and Cush. I don't think Cush exists as a country today, but generally southern Egypt. Um, and he gets all this wealth, he gets all this power. But then in verse 44, news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. So there's this news that he hears that freaks him out. He's capable of being alarmed, of being scared, of being threatened. He knows that he's not completely omnipotent. If he really knew that he was, like, if he were actually God, and if he really believed it, he wouldn't be scared. You know, he, he, he wouldn't be afraid of this news that comes. So when he's making all these boasts, oh, he knows. He knows that he's not God. He knows it's a lie. Because here he knows that he's finite. He knows that he might not win. He's not all powerful. So he, he goes out um, from to the east and the north, and he, he just goes in this great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction as if to say, well, there's this threat against me. I just have to completely squash it and stomp it out, and then I'll have my power and I'll be safe. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. So he's setting up his camp, setting up his army near glorious holy mountain, which is Jerusalem. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. He shall come to his end. The true Christ shall come and destroy the false Christ. The true Christ comes and destroys the Antichrist in in full victory. The, The Antichrist will not reign forever. He'll be stopped 
Jesus will not allow the blasphemy and the violence to continue. He'll rescue his people and this, like the saints from this false Christ who's persecuting them. He will rescue, he will save, and Christ will be king. Revelation 19, 11 to 21 talks about this battle. And it's intense. So starting from verse 11, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has, writ he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, but the name, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called out to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army." And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in his presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. And we're like, holy crap, that's intense. Um, but that's, like, you, you see, like, in this scene, like, heaven is open and Christ comes down in the fullness of his glory and his majesty, as if to say, I'm God. I am the true Lord. And, and the beast, this, this Antichrist, has gathered all the nations of the world to make war against Christ. And, and I think that news from the north and the east that's alarming him is this news that, Christ might be coming back. And so he gathers all that he has and all of his power to say, no, Jesus comes back, we'll kill him. We, we got this. And it doesn't even talk about any fight. It's like they gather, and then in verse 20, the beast was captured. It was, like, it was really fast. Jesus didn't hardly have to do anything. And in, in 2 Thessalonians, it says, like, by the breath of his mouth, he destroys him. Jesus just breathes. And all of this power and glory and might that he tried to make for himself, it just comes to nothing against the actual power and glory of God. So our response to all this, I'm actually wrapping up, guys. This is great. Um, I mean, the first response is to simply give God glory. Like we, we give God glory for who he is. We acknowledge his lordship. We praise him for what he's done. Like all throughout Revelation, you, you get these little bits of, like the John sees into like the, the throne room of God. And all there is is just like, holy, holy, holy. Like all day, they're just crying out like, holy, you're glorious, you're powerful, you're mighty. That's the song. That's always going on. Our response also has to be, take into account the, the warning here. So this, this gospel of Jesus Christ is both good news and a warning. Those who accept Christ receive eternal life. We, we are with him forever. Our sins are forgiven. They're all taken away. But those who reject the gospel, they hear this good news and they reject it. Those who deny the lordship of Christ, they face the same wrath as this beast. Revelation 14, 9 to 12. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image, it's the Antichrist, 
and receives the mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. That's in the Bible. <laughs> we have to take that seriously. Those who reject Christ have to deal with those consequences. Guys, we serve a holy God. His love exists in the context of his holiness and his justice. And in the end, we'll either worship the true Christ or the false Christ, and there's no middle ground. There's, there's no sitting on any fence. There's no, I'll decide later. It's one or the other. The last passage that I'm going to read to you is from Joshua. It's verse, or chapter 24, verses 14 to 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We, we get to choose who we're going to follow. Um, and like our, I hope that our prayer would be, and, and our response would be following, <coughs> following the true king, following and serving the true Lord. Because he's the one who's actually worthy of it. I mean, he saved us. That's, that's this, this gospel. He, he redeemed us from sin so that we wouldn't worship the false Christ. So let's take that seriously. Father in heaven, you're holy. Your name is holy. Everything you are is holy. God, you're full of, you're full of power. You're full of righteousness. You're so, so full of justice. You don't let sin stand. You don't let sin and evil win forever. You have a plan to put an end to it all. And you, you've started by putting an end to it in us. You've already, you've already begun the process of renewing the world by renewing us. You've, you've taken away our dead hearts. You gave us new hearts that can love you and worship you and obey you. God, help us to, to really live that out. Help us to live lives that actually reflect the fact that you've saved us. We pray that you would protect us. We pray that you would give us the ability to discern um, the, the lies that exist in this world. Help us to see when the worldview of the culture around us is opposed to you. And help our, help our worldview and our understanding of, of life to be based on you, based, based on your word, based on the things that you have said, because everything you've said, God, is true. Every word you speak is true. God, help us to love your word. Help us to, help us to love your word. Help us to love you. And, and God, we, we, we do declare that you are our King, you are our Lord, you are our God, and there is no other who deserves that place. There's no one else who's worthy of that place, and you alone are worthy. For you alone are God. We give you glory, we give you praise, and we thank you for all of this. And we pray that in Jesus' name.